The Picts were one of the main groups of ancient Scotland from the 3rd to the 9th century AD before merging with the Gaels in 843 AD to form the Kingdom of Alapa, the embryonic Kingdom of Scotland. But there is much more to the Picts however. One of their origin stories is that they came from Scythia, a region just north of the Black Sea around parts of modern Ukraine and Russia, but is there any truth to this? And what about recent studies into Pictish DNA? Did they shed any light on the Scythian connection and their origins in general? This is the story of the Picts. They first appear in the historical record in 297 AD when a Roman writer spoke of the Picts and the Scots attacking Hadrian's Wall. And their name, given to them by the Romans, probably means painted people, either because they painted themselves in battle or perhaps because they were heavily tattooed. Firstly though, let's look at their beautiful standing stones. And in case you're wondering, I am sitting on the ground. As soon as I started recording audio, the wind went mental. And there is also a road there as well that you can just hear a car going by. So apologies about that. But yeah, today I've taken you to Aberlemno, a village near Forfar, and the site of numerous Pictish symbol stones. Potentially this was quite a high status site of the ancient Picts. And shortly I'll actually take you to the, the Kirkyard and there's another massive Pictish standing stone uh, which is well worth seeing. But yeah, this is Aberlemno 1. As far as the symbology of the stone, the top symbol looks to be a serpent and maybe a depiction of the native Scottish adder snake. In general, animals are a common feature of Pictish symbol stones. So the middle symbol on this stone is the double disc and Z-rod. So as you can see, um, disc here, disc here, and then the Z-rod is running right through it. So this is quite a mysterious symbol, numerous different theories as to what it actually means. Some say it might represent a wheel of some sort. Others say that potentially these, these discs uh, represent some sort of stone, almost like a pestle and mortar, to potentially grind grains down or something of that ilk. So this is the first time I've actually been here in person and seen the double disc and Z-rod on the stone in person. And actually looking at the, the Z-rod in person, particularly the top of the Z-rod, which is maybe just out of frame, but I'll, I'll cut in some B-roll. But the very top of the, the Z-rod potentially looks like the top of a stalk of wheat. So, so the idea that these might have been symbolising grinding stones of some sort. Something potentially to grind down wheat or, or other grains or other plants is potentially one idea. There are various other theories on what the double disc and Z-rod means, and please let me know your thoughts below. I should note as well that the double disc can be found on other Pictish stones with or without the Z-rod as well. So the third symbol is a mirror and comb right at the bottom here. So as you can see, that's the mirror and the handle of the mirror, and then that's the comb there. There's a really good drawing, drawing just on the plaque there that will cut in. That gives a, a good rendition so you can see it ex exactly type thing. But as you can see, that, that's the comb there, and then that's the mirror. Um, and obviously quite, quite a lot of detail, but still quite intricately pre preserved still to this day. It may simply reflect the object, or it could symbolise marriage or female wealth. Others argue it has a more metaphorical meaning, such as a representation of the soul, or a reflection of life on earth. So as far as the age of this stone, it is well over a thousand years old, thought to be either 1300 to 1500 years old, and it's still quite remarkable how well preserved it is, given that it's well over a thousand years old. During the winter as well, I should note, these stones are covered in wooden boxes, and it's only in April, early April, that they come off, basically to protect them from the frost, obviously over the winter time. There is not just this symbol stone here, there are two other Pictish symbol stones just at the side of this road, and one in a, a nearby kirkyard as well that we'll visit later. So what do they tell us about the Picts and what do they symbolise? This is Aberlemno 3. The first thing to note is that this stone would have been a real awe-inspiring sculpture in its day. For reference, I'm 6 foot 3 and I look tiny compared to it. I never realised as well before I came here that in their day some scholars believed that these stones were painted and were full of colour. People must have come from across Pickland to pray here and I can only imagine how powerful an image this stone must have been in its day. It features a Celtic cross and intricate Celtic patterns. There are five circular bosses on the cross which may represent the wounds of Christ. For reference, the Picts did convert to Christianity over a process of decades and centuries, probably beginning around the 5th century AD. Below the cross is two angels reading gospel books. At the bottom of this there are animals, one definitely a deer or a stag, with the other side looking to be a violent depiction of the animal kingdom. On the back of this stone is once again the double disc and Z-rod. Above this it seems to be a version of another mysterious Pictish symbol, the crescent V-rod. The crescent component of this symbol is thought to represent the sun or the moon. 
The V is often composed of arrows, one pointing downwards and another upwards. It has been suggested that it represents the arrival of a soul at birth and its return upon death. Below there is a hunting scene and at the bottom there are other depictions of animals. Now this is Aberlemno too, in the Kirkyard close by. It is carved from old red sandstone and again must have been some site in its day, standing at 2.3 metres or around 7 foot 5 feet tall. Once again it has a religious design and shows the fusion of Christian and Celtic cultures with its Celtic cross and various other intricate patterns. The reverse of this stone includes a stunning depiction of a battle in great detail. Now the reverse of the original stone is quite faded, but there is a replica in the car park with great detail. You can see warriors on horseback, some holding spears, and others seemingly with bows and arrows, or some sort of crossbow in hand. Although debated, one argument that this depicts the Great Pictish victory in the Battle of Dunnecton against the Northumbrians. At the bottom right we can see a warrior being attacked by a bird. The sign notes that this might be a raven feasting on the Northumbrian king. Now very quickly the central roadside stone, or Aberlemno 5, bears only traces of incised marks. It potentially featured a crescent, maybe a moon or a mirror, but it's hard to make out. Aberlemno 4 is in a local museum and has a horseshoe and a symbol known as the Pictish Beast, which may be a Kelpie. Before we move on to the Scythian connection and Pictish DNA, I also wanted to touch on what these stones' purpose may have been. Although there are numerous theories, one of the signs here suggested that the potential could have been used as a form of money in a sense, as a way to mark land ownership. This made me think of the story of the Rai stones that were highly valued by the Yapese people of Micronesia. They used these stones as a form of money, and as they were too large and too heavy to move, ownership was established and transferred through an oral tradition and history. If you made a deal with your neighbour, for instance, to extend your land, you would basically tell everyone in the tribe that your neighbour now owned this stone without the stone actually physically changing hands. An interesting thought of the Picts had a similar system. Now before we look at Pictish DNA, let's look at the origin story that connects them to Scythia. Now people that are new to this channel may not have heard of Scythia before, I have made numerous other videos on the Scythians that I'll link above, well worth watching, they're one of my favourite people actually. They lived on the Eurasian steppe just north of the Black Sea and they were very much known for being masters of the horse, amongst other things. Now the Picts in general, outside of, of symbol stones, standing stones, and a set of like, things like lists of kings etc, didn't really leave a lot for us to, to trace their origins, didn't really write a lot down like many other Celtic cultures or Celtic connected cultures. One guy who did write a lot down was a guy called Bede in the ecclesiastical history of the English people. So Bede essentially was a Northumbrian monk who lived in the 8th century AD I believe off the top of my head, um, who wrote obviously this book, The Ecclesiastical History of the English People, where it goes through numerous origin stories of different people, the Britons and the Picts, etc. But in relation to the Picts, one of the origin stories, or the origin story he gives for the Picts, references Scythia as the place they originally came from, and they sailed to Britain, and I'll go through exactly what Bede said, because it is a really interesting story, with lots of interesting details. It says they basically journeyed via Ireland, and then were told of, of Scotland, what became Scotland, what we know of Scotland today. Bede also describes how the Picts potentially selected kings from the female line, as opposed to the, the male line, which was more common. Is there any truth to this? Well, the study that we're going to look at on the genetics of the Picts actually goes into this and looks at this in a little more detail, um, but that'll be the, the last section of this video. But what did Bede actually write? The Pictish race from Scythia sailed out into the ocean on a few warships and were carried by the wind beyond the furthest bounds of Britain, reaching Ireland. There they found the Irish race and asked permission to settle among them, but the request was refused. The Irish answered that an island would not hold them both, but said they, we know another island not far from our own, in an easterly direction which we can often see in the distance on clear days. If you go there, you can make a settlement for yourselves, but if anyone resists you, make use of our help. And so the Picts went to Britain and proceeded to occupy the northern parts of the island. As the Picts had no wives, they asked the Irish for some. They later consented to give them women, only on condition that, in all cases of doubt, they should elect their kings from the female royal line rather than the male. And it is well known that this custom has been observed amongst the Picts to this day. Now this is a fascinating story with lots of interesting details, but what does the genetic research say about this? 
Now very quickly, if you like this jumper, please check out my merch store in the top link in the video description below. Your support really helps me take these videos to the next level and take you to places like this. A massive thank you for all your support in general and the people on Patreon that support me. You can also check out my Patreon page if you want ad-free videos and also your name in the credits. But thanks again and now on with the video. Well, an interesting paper was published just last year that looked at Pictish DNA. This study analysed eight Pictish individuals, one from Ballantor in Easter and Ross, and seven from London Lynx in Fife, representing the northern and southern parts of Pictland, and co analysed these with over 8,000 previously published ancient and modern genomes. Now, let's start with Pictish haplogroups. The mitochondrial haplogroups observed in the samples are common in present-day Northern Western Europeans, with the subclan J1C3 being identified in three individuals out of eight. In terms of paternal Y chromosome lineages, we assigned one of the London links to R1B DF49, which is predominantly distributed in the UK and Ireland, and a subclad to R1B P312, or the S116 haplogroup, introduced to Britain by Bell Beaker peoples during the Calcolithic, alongside step related ancestry. During the Calcolithic, R1B derived haplogroups largely replaced the predominant I2A Y chromosome lineage in the British Neolithic, except in Orkney, where I2A persisted into the Bronze Age. R1B subclads are extremely common across Britain and Western Europe from the Iron Age onwards. So interestingly we can see the presence of the Bell Beaker peoples in the pics. I have made various other videos on the Bell Beaker peoples previously that I'll link above if you haven't seen them before. Overall, however, this study found evidence of a more local origin of the pics than Bede's account. We demonstrate genetic affinities between the Pictish genomes and Iron Age people who lived in Britain, which supports current archaeological theories of a local origin. The autosomal genomes also allowed us to detect haplotype sharing between the Pictish genomes and present-day Europeans. Our results demonstrate a proportionally higher degree of haplotype sharing and thus genetic affinity between the Pictish genomes and individuals from Western Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and Northumbria. Lastly, the seven mitochondrial DNA from the London Lynx Cemetery showed that these individuals had no direct maternal ancestors, which could suggest exchanges of people, or at least females between groups during the Pictish period, challenging older ideas that the Picts were a matrilineal society. On the point of succession down the female line, the authors make an interesting point earlier in the study, noting that many now believe that this origin legend was intended to reinforce Pictish identity and to legitimise particular kings whose claims to the throne were through their mothers. So what are we to make of all this? This study didn't find evidence to support the Scythian connection or the female royal line theory, so does this mean that Bede's account was just a fantasy? Well perhaps or perhaps not. The reality is that this study looked at quite a small sample size, only 8 people, and may or may not represent the whole of Pickland. Bede must have got his story from somewhere. Perhaps a small number of Scythians did reach Pickland at one point, and this could be the root of the story. Or perhaps Bede just loved a bit of creative writing. It's hard to say, but further research will expand our understanding of the Picts. Now these stones are well worth seeing if you live nearby or you're visiting Scotland and it's not too far out of your way. I would recommend it. I know Aberlemna is a wee bit tricky to get to for some people, but if you're not too far away, I would definitely nip past here. It's well worth seeing. But one interesting element that came up in this video was the presence of Bell Beaker DNA and Pictish DNA. But who were the Bell Beaker people and what impact did they have not just on Scotland, ancient Scotland, but the whole of Britain? To find out, please click here. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and hit the bell and tell your friends and family about this channel and I'll see you next time.